Hi, I'm Mike Robbins. I'm a product developer at Psycho, and this is my talk, The Physical Web with Psycho. So, this talk is a little bit of an experiment to see what we can achieve when we mix Psycho, Bluetooth beacons, and IoT. IoT is all about the Internet of Things. It's about internet-connected devices, and there's many of these available, and the price is constantly coming down on them. Microsoft is really embracing IoT at the moment, and they brought out a flavor window designed especially for these IoT devices. It's called Windows 10 Core. And it's bringing the frameworks and the tools we know to internet connected devices. So let's start with the Bluetooth beacon. So what actually is a Bluetooth beacon? So these are small devices capable of transmitting the URL of Bluetooth. It doesn't have to be a limited URL. We can also send other metadata uh, and attachments. But this is a Psycho talk, so we'll be using Psycho for our content and assets. We'll have a look at that a little bit later. There's two main platforms for these Bluetooth beacons. Firstly, we have Google's Eddystone framework. So this has been designed by uh, Google. It's completely open source, and it runs on any platform. So this will work on iOS, Android, and Windows. It has support within apps, as I just mentioned. And it also has support within the mobile mobile Chrome browser, so we can actually use beacons in there. The other platform is Apple's iBeacon. This is mean being designed by Apple and is mainly for iOS. However, there is some Google Android apps that are making use of these. The only issue with it currently is that it's not supported within the mobile browser, within Safari, but it's only supported within apps. But hopefully Apple will fix that soon. One thing to note, though, if you are transmitting URLs, is there is a character limit. So if you're building up complex URLs with many query string parameters, you're probably going to have to use a URL shortener. And a little bit of background on Bluetooth beacons. These can be picked up for about $30, uh, 30 euros. They're quite cheap. But you can actually build them even cheaper yourselves. So this um, device at the bottom of the screen here is a Ratify Zero. Really cheap devices. You can get them for four or five euros. And you can actually build a Bluetooth beacon yourself. The advantage of using an internet-connected device to build a Bluetooth beacon yourself means you have a lot more flexibility. You could add sensors to RC Pi, such as temperature or humidity, and actually use that data in your beacon, transmit that data. You can also connect that up to a web service in Psycho if you wished, and you can change that URL and do personalization on that URL as well if you wanted to. Okay, so let's talk about my idea for this presentation. We're going to look at a website that's been built on Psycho. It's a zoo. It's just a demo app website. We're then going to have a look at how we can actually leverage Bluetooth beacons into this website. So at the moment, this website's only being used before somebody comes to our physical zoo. So they might have a research of how to, how to actually get there, what animal species available, and so on. The issue is then when they come to our zoo, our physical zoo, the website's forgotten. It's out of the way. It's never used again. What we wanted to do is actually bring that website into the journey as they're traveling around our physical zoo. So the idea here is to have Bluetooth beacons dotted around the park. So as people walking around, they're going to be pushed in, be pushed a notification on their phone, which will then encourage them to visit parts of the website that's really relevant to the bit of zoo they're at. We're going to record some back some of this data to XDB, which is really valuable to marketers. And then we can see what we can achieve with this data once we have it. So firstly, let's have a look at this website and see what we have, what we're working with. So this is our website for our zoo. As you can see, we have a home page. And at the bottom here, we have a list of all our animals, so the species that are available at the zoo. If we click on one of these, you can see we've dived in. We can see a nice banner image of the animal. And then we're going to see a little bit about this animal. Obviously, in a production website, you'll probably have a bit more interactive content, videos, and so on. But this is just a demo site. Tim goes for any of these pages you click on. You're just going to see a banner and some image about uh, some content about that particular animal. So, how can we make this website more, uh, well, use Bluetooth speakers and make it more relevant while they walk around the park? 
So how about we add some Bluetooth beacons to these animal enclosures? So say as somebody approaches that tiger, they get a notification on their phone that they're approaching the tiger, which they can then click that link, be taken into the website, and actually be taken to this page. So they can actually read about the animal they're seeing. And that'll be the same for each animal. We'll have a Bluetooth beacon next to each animal. Okay, jumping back to the presentation. So, as I said, with the idea here is we're going to create some beacons to start transmitting the URL of the animal the visitor actually stood next to as they walk around our zoo. So, for this to work, we're going to have to have a beacon next to each individual animal, which will transmit its own unique URL. So, when I was looking at how I could actually achieve this, I was trying to work out what platform I could do to make this work. And I've come across this great little platform on the bottom here. Somebody's basically ported the Eddystone beacon to Node.js. And then Node.js is capable of running on a Raspberry Pi. So it allows us to do beacons that way. There's some really good documentation on this website if you need to know how to install this framework onto the beacon. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump into my Raspberry Pi, and I'll show you how you can use the beacon, how you can create a beacon, how you can get that up and running. So what I've got here. This is just a remote desktop into my uh, Raspberry Pi. This is a default install of Raspbian. So Raspbian is the kind of um, preferred choice for Raspberry Pi development. It's just the one they they heavily invest in. So on this on this machine here, I've just installed Node.js and I've installed that framework I just showed you, the Eddy Stone for, for Node.js. And if I go up here, I've got a shortcut up here. I've written some example scripts to show you how the beacons work. So I'll jump into this one here and jump into this JavaScript file. So this is just my node script. So as you can see, I make it slightly smaller to make sure you can see. Oops. There you go. So all the first thing we need to do is require in the actual framework. So as you can see, we're using require JS there traverse up the tree to find the actual Eddy Stone Beacon JavaScript file. So this is just the kind of framework. And it's really easy to use. All we have to do is call this advertise URL method, pass the URL we're going to transmit. So in this example, I have a URL shortened, because I've got quite a complex URL here. And secondly, you can optionally pass in a name for the beacon. It's not required, but it helps debug in to know which beacon you're looking at, rather than just looking at a, a shortened URL. Users will never actually see this. So if we just enable our first one. So our tiger, so comment those out and enable that one. Only one beacon be run at a time. So if you want multiple, you can have to have multiple beacons running. So just the requirement for this. And then what we want to do is actually call this script to actually fire up the beacon. So what I've created on the desktop here. So this is a bit of code that's just going to call that script I've showed you and start the beacon. So if I copy that, if we go into a new terminal window, and if we paste in that script, all that's doing is going to call our script we file, presenter, and that's it. That's our beacon up and running. It's really simple to do. So if I just prove that's working, we connect to my phone. I bring this across so you can see it. So this is my connection to my phone. So the way this works for iOS is when we swap, swipe down to the top of the screen, we get into all, all our apps and control center widgets. If we press the edit button, we can add other widgets here. And one of them is the Chrome one, as you can see, second from the bottom, if I move that from the bottom there. And once that's on, it'll start hunting for these beacons. As you can see, it's about my tiger. One thing to note here, though, is Google will do a web request to this URL. It will take the title of the page from the HTML, so as you can see, this is my tiger. It will also show the, the URL and shorten to the user. But obviously, if you have a local host website, it's like Google can't request to that, and therefore it won't work. So what I've done here is create a little proxy service on Azure, which will show some content to Google, but when the user hits it, it'll just do a JavaScript and um, redirect and take you to the actual live, to the local host web website. So if we click, whoops. If you click that tiger link there, click that, 
will be taken into Chrome, taken to the Azure website, which will then forward across. Live website obviously won't do that. And you can see now we're at our Tiger page. So that's our beacon transmitting correctly and taking us to the relevant content. That's great. That's working perfectly. So if we jump back into our presentation. Oops. We can actually extend this even further if we wished. Because we are just passing through query strings, we can add anything we want to them. So how about if we added a sense to the Raspberry Pi to detect moisture? And then it could, it could then see if it was raining. And then we could suggest indoor activities that I used instead. Or how about if we add a motion sensor in there, proximity sensor? We can work out if an animal was up and moving around. We could suggest the user, hey, the snow leopard's up and feeding. How about you go and see that instead? But actually missing a trick here. All this data is really relevant. We know the users come to our zoo, actual physical zoo. We know they've been to see certain animals. Perhaps they've been to the visitor center. Perhaps we know what they've bought at that cafe, if they've got a cafe there. This is all stuff that marketers would love to have. So that's where XDB comes in. So how about if we capture every animal the visitor's seen and store that in, in their experience profile? To do this, we'll have to create a custom facet. We'll call it visit animals. We'll update the speak UI. So within the experience profile, we can see which animals the user's seen. How about we also create a cycle campaign and we can track the physical zoo visit. So we know somebody's come to our actual zoo. We can actually store that. We can mark them later give them discounts for coming to the zoo again, for example. So let's jump into Visual Studio, and I can show you how this is pieced together. So if I jump into here. The way I've structured this project is very much like Cycle Habitats works. So I'm not going to dive in there too much, because there's other, other talks on that. But if we go into my foundation layer, what I've done is got an XDB project here. And I've created two repositories. So my contact repository is basically just a wrapper around the standard, con standard contact repository in XDB. So we're going to create contact, update contact, find contact, and so on. So they're just wrappers around those to make it a little bit easier to work with for this demo. I also have a facet repository, which allows you to get a facet by name for a particular contact, an update person information method for a contact, and then to get those personal information facets back as well. So the first thing we want to do is actually define the facets that we want to use to store this data about an animal. So if I jump into this project up here, I've already done that. So the first thing we need is, a, is an element. So this is the data we're going to store for every single animal the user has seen. So we're going to grab the animal's name the ID of that item, that page in Cycle, and the date they've actually seen that animal. What we do then, we'll have a facet, which will then store a collection of these. So over time, we can build up a collection of every animal I use has seen. And if they return to the zoo multiple times, we can capture that information as well. There's obviously some uh, XML config files that go with this, but I'm not going to dive into that too much. I'm not going to touch on that. But the source code will be available for you to have a look at. So if we go into our project layer now, I have an analytics controller. So the idea here is this analytics controller is going to be on every page that's about an animal, the animal pay, animal detail page. And what we're going to do is then when they hit that page, it's actually right, in, right into those facets about the animal they've seen. If I put the code in and then I can walk you through it, I'll delete that. That's just an empty action I put there to compile. And then if we put this code in. So what we're going to do, firstly, is check whether that tracker is active. If it's not, we're going to start it. And then because this, this um, control is on every single animal detail page, we don't want to write into XDB if the user is just browsing the website, if they haven't come from a beacon. So the idea, I've created a cycle campaign, just a standard cycle campaign, and this is a GUID for it. It's called the Zoo Visit Campaign. And what I've done here is I've got a public property that just wraps up the query string um, for the campaign. So what we're going to do is just check whether that query string from the current request 
has that particular campaign code in it. And what we'll do, every every Bluetooth beacon that transmits the URL will have that campaign code in it. So if that campaign code is in the query in the query string, we know they come from a Bluetooth beacon. Then we get to the XDB side of things. What we're going to do is we'll get that facet. So that's from the facet repository I showed you earlier. So we get that zoo visit facet we defined for the particular contact, and that's just the name of the facet. We'll create an instance of an element, and we'll populate those data, that data. So we'll get the ID, so it's the current page in this current item in this context. The title, which is the animal's name, so that's just the title field in Cycoff I've used for this. And then we're going to take to take take the date time now, and that's when they've actually seen the animal, and that will get written into XDB. Actually, it won't get written into XDB till the session ends. So when the session ends, we'll flush that data through to XDB. For this, for the purpose of this demo, we're not going to sit here for 20 minutes for that to happen. So I've created a controller that will actually end the session, which I'll show you in a second. The one other thing that's really useful to XDB is if you can actually identify the contact you're working with. So if you can actually assign a email address, a first name, surname to that contact, it makes it a lot more relevant and a more, lot more useful. So in a production website, you might use a register form or a contact us, some way you can get personal information from the user to actually associate to their contact. For this demo, I've made it a little bit easier. Obviously, this will be used in the production environment, but I've created a couple of controllers. So I've got an identify session controller, which just takes the username, first name, and surname, uh, and then calls session identifier. So I'll identify the current session to this contact. In this case, my identifier is going to be the email address. So I'm going to use the email address of the user. We're then going to get an instance of our contact personal information facet, and we're going to populate the first name and surname. And I'll show you this in action in a second. This is just helps with debugging, really, and testing. If I just build this a second so I can get that working when I show you the next bit. So we just warm cycle up and jump, and jump back to Visual Studio. The other thing I said I had was a way of abandoning the session just to just for debugging so we haven't got to sit there waiting for the timeout. So the way I've done this, again, another controller. So we have a flush session controller, and all that does is call session abandon. And then once that happens, everything will get flushed through to XDB, and then the aggregation will happen. It'll be available in the reporting server, which I'll show you in a second. So if Cycle's warmed up, it's just finishing warming up. So, yep, it's finished. So what we're going to do now is actually show you all this in play. So the first thing we want to do, our beacon's still up and running. So if we jump back into our phone, So here's our phone. So the first thing we want to do, if we call that identify controller, just so we can assign some information to them. So if we just kill this page, and I've got a bookmark to do this. Stored in here, bookmarks, identify. So when this loads, so that's done. So all it's doing here is going to take some of those parameters I've done. So I've got test at subcon.com, and I've got my first name and surname in there. So that's me identified to XDB. So now if we swipe down from the top of the screen, we should be able to find our Bluetooth beacon. Here we do, our tiger. If we click that, we'll be taken back into here, and we now see the tiger page. So as we've been walking around the zoo, we've seen our tiger. We're now going to come across our snow leopard. So to do in real life, this will be multiple beacons. But if I simulate that by stopping, if I kill the terminal, that will stop the, the beacon because only one beacon can run at a time. So I've commented out the tiger, commented in the snow leopard. And if I hit up, press enter, that's that beacon up and running again. So if we now back, jump back into our phone, swipe down from the top of the screen again. On Android, this appears on the home page, on the lock screen. You can see now we've got our snow leopard. We've come across our snow leopard. You can click that again. 
We've gone through to our snow leopard, getting the hang of this. If we jump back into here, we've seen our snow leopard. We carry around walking on a zoo. So we've come across our owl. So if I kill that, so that our beacon stopped. Quite easy to get these beacons working. Let's press enter. Now it's our next that beacon up and running. We go back into our phone. We've seen snow leopard. We come across our owl. We get the notification. We click that. We get taken in and seen our owl. So that's great. So now as our session expires, when our session abandons, it will then flush that through DirectDB. Like I said, I've created a nice controller here to simulate that. So if you go back into our bookmarks and click flush session, that's just going to call session abandon. So that's now pushed everything through to XDB. So if we jump back into, into Sitecore, we should be able to see that data being stored into our experience profile. So I'll just show you that. Okay, so just log into site call. We jump into the experience profile. We can see Mike Test, so that's our latest visitor. So that's us. We then click on that. We first have a look at our activity. You can see our campaigns. So we hit three campaigns because we were transmitting the campaign code each for each beacon. So you can see we've seen our eagle owl, our snow leopard, and our tiger. That's great. We then have a look at the top. We've created a custom uh, tab here called Visit Animals, which is going to look at our custom facet. So click that. We can see here. This is coming from our beacon, so our tiger, snow leopard, and eagle owl. So that's the ones we saw today. You can see the date times we saw them as well. So every beacon is then writing into XTB, so that's working great. Oops. So how can we actually use this data we've got in XDB? How about we create a kiosk application for the souvenir zoo, souvenir shop for the zoo? So the idea here is to create an application that can run on an internet connected device, such as Raspberry Pi, and then put this in the souvenir shop. We'll have a touch screen on the, connected to the Raspberry Pi, which gives them a nice UI to work with. And then we can actually start pulling stuff from XDB. So we can query XDB, get a list of all the animals they've seen today, and then we can suggest souvenirs they could buy based on the animals they've seen. Or maybe we could spawn again to sponsor a particular animal. If we can see over the over the day that they've kept going back to the tiger, perhaps we will try and push that and ask them if they'll let us sponsor that animal. So the first thing we need to do to get this to work is actually expose the data from XDB. Great way to do this is Cypher Services Client. It's a great framework built by Psycho that allows us to create controllers and a web API that we work with, Psycho handles all the authentication for us and all the validation of the model, and we just write the implementation to work with what bit we like to. 
in this case is going to be XDB. So we can write the layer to actually talk to XDB and then Cycle will do all the authentication for us. So for this, we're going to look up a contact from XDB using the unique identifier. So that's the email address in this case. And then we're going to return back a list of all the animals they've seen from that custom facet we created. So let's jump into Visual Studio and I'll show how this works together. So firstly, we need to have a look in my model here. So this is the data we're going to be exposing over XDB. So the first thing we have is this person here. So we're going to expose their email address. So that's also a unique identifier. Their first name, their surname, and then we can have a, a list of all the animals they've seen today. So if we jump into those animals. Whoops, get rid of that. So this is the data we're going to be exposing. So we're using we use the Cycle as a content repository here. We're actually mixing data from Sitecore and XDB data. So for example, here we've got the ID, name, description, and image of that animal. That's all coming from content within Sitecore. But that date they've actually seen them is from XDB. So we're actually using XDB data to make the content from Psycho really relevant. Just pull the data that's relevant to them. So once you've done that, you have to obviously create your um, repository. So I've got a repository here that's just going to allow us to work with um, finding a contact. It literally goes in that content repository I showed you earlier. We're going to look at the contact ID, and then we've got a little class that's going to map it into this person object that I showed you. So when that's all working together, if I go back into my web browser, and we hit this method here, I can show you. So this is what the web API looked like. So we're going to call our our controller and then pass in our unique identifier. So this is the ID uh, unique identifier or the email address in this case. And you can see the data will be returned. We've got their first name, surname, email address, blank. I think that's a bug. And then an array of animals, my bug. And we have the ID, the name, and description of each of these animals. And then we have in that for each animal. That's great. So we have an API that's returning all this data to us. The next step is our kiosk. So how are we going to make this kiosk? So the idea I've got here, so this is the kiosk application. We'll have a welcome screen where you can type in an email address, and then you press the lookup button. This is going to then authenticate against like, uh, SSC, it's like service client first, because every request needs to be authenticated to use that service. And then we're going to look at that contact by that email address. Once they've done that, they'll be taken across to the second screen, as you can see here which is going to give them a list of all the animals. So we're going to get a list of animals from Psycho, and we we'll bind that out to the screen. And then they click on one of those individual animals, and then go into a detail page, and then they can sponsor it or buy a soft toy. So how are we going to do this? So as I mentioned earlier, Microsoft are really pushing IoT with Windows 10 Core. So we're going to have a look at how we can use this platform. One of the good things they have with this platform is the idea of universal Windows apps. And this is basically an application you can build that will run on any Windows 10 device. It's really universal. So you can run them on Raspberry Pi 2 or 3. They're the ones we run in Windows 10 Core. The Xbox One, even. Unfortunately, I can't fly an Xbox One out to demo, but it does work. I've tried it. Any Windows 10 laptop, Windows 10 mobile, or even HoloLens. You can even run HoloLens apps using this. Really powerful. So this application then can communicate to SSE. It's like a services client and pull that data in for us. So let's jump into Visual Studio. I'll show you a little bit about um, Windows Universal apps, and then we'll, we'll write this kiosk application to get it working. So jump into the project here. As you can see, I have another project called Windows Universal. This is our application. So you create pages, so they kind of views. But there's obviously a bit of code behind it, so it's a little bit like a web forms idea. So we have the welcome page. So it's all XAML based. So we write all our XAML in here. Wait for the UI to load up. And you can see we have a welcome text, which you saw in that screenshot. And then we have a text block with it with a caption of email address. And then we're gonna just grab the email address and have a button, which I'll show the code for in a little bit. And as you can see, this is the this is the designer to show you what that looks like. You've seen this in the screenshot. But this is the this is the power. You can see all the devices we support. So you can see this in the UI. So we got 
tablets, phones, desktop, Xbox, Surface, IoT devices, and so on. There'll be more. I'm sure Microsoft will add more to this in the future. So the first thing we need to do, like I said, everything with Cycle Services Client has to be authenticated. So let's add the authentication service. So we have a Cycle Authentication service down here. And I've got an empty controller here, uh, empty method here that we'll put some code into. And we'll talk that through. So if I drop this in. So we're just going to create a new instance of the HTTP client. Just allows us to talk to a web service in this case. We're then going to build the authentication. So there has to be as JSON. And this is just your standard Cycle login. So you see domain, username, and password. So you can see we have Cycle admin and B classic cycle details there and then we're just going to pass through that to as json we're then going to do a post so we have the base url here which i'll show you first which is the standard for um cycle services clients so we have cycle slash api so ssc everything lives within that uh, root and then we're going to call auth login i'm going to pass through those auth details so that's just going to do a, a post with those auth details and we're just going to wait that results as an async call. We're then going to ensure we have a success message rather than a, a, an error thrown or a, a false login. And then what we need to do, um, Cycle works with .NET membership. So it runs with forms authentication. So we're going to get back an auth cookie, the ASP auth cookie, as you can see here. And this needs to be passed through for every request to Cycle service clients. That's its uh, authentication token. So all we're going to do here is return that. You can see the task of HTTP cookie. We'll return that, and we're just going to store that in a variable for the session of this, this particular user, and then we'll, we'll get rid of that later. So that's the authentication done. Next thing we need to do is actually request our controller we created. So this one, to actually return that data, we can then bind to it later. So let's do that. So we have our person service here. It takes in the auth cookie we had previously. So that's how we authenticate, like I mentioned. If we put our method in here, so we then got our get services. So this works a little bit, well, very similar, but we only do one extra step, and that's setting the cookie first. So we use this cookie manager to set our auth cookie. That's, way, that's how we pass it through authentication. The other thing is Cycle Service Client has to run over HTTPS, so make sure you've done that as well. And then we're going to call a get, because it's just a get request, get async to that base URL I showed you. And then we're going to do, we're going to basically build up this URL we have in the, the uh, query string here. So our unique identifier. So that's our email address. We capture that from that um, text box. That's the email address. Again, we're going to check for a, a success. And then we're going to read back the response, which is just JSON. So it's going to be a JSON representation of our model we exposed. And then I've got a class here that's going to turn that into a model, into an, uh, to a model here, which is pretty much what we've seen the other side. You need to identify email address, first name, surname, a list of animals. Once that's done, then we can bind that out to a view. So looking at our view or our page, we've got our visited animals. So this is where our collection of animals are. We have actually got this data now. We just need to bind it. So this is the code behind. So if I pull the code in, I can talk you through it. Uh, we'll take that out. So basically what we've done, we've got this get person, current person here, which is basically going off to a variable. We've stored that result back from that uh, call to our controller. So we've stored that. And the way this works with um, universal Windows applications is you you use observer collections to bind to something. It's kind of like a little bit like a repeater, but it's two ways. So if you add items in there, they will appear um, as soon as they as soon as they're added. If you add another animal to this collection, the UI will update instantly. It's quite good because you could actually build this in such a way that as people are traveling in zoo, this UI could be updated in real time. So all we're doing here is basically going through a list of animals and adding this collection, which then the view is actually bound to. So if I build this project, so I deploy it. So this will run on a, on a Raspberry Pi, but unfortunately, I don't think you get any more Raspberry Pis out through airport security without getting detained. So this is just going to run on my Windows 10 machine. 
So this is just a way of uh, testing it on here. But if you did run on Raspberry Pi, you can deploy it from Visual Studio. You can attach the process on Visual Studio. You can have your full debugging experience. So if I press play here, this will run it on my local machine. So this is just launched my other screen. If I drag it across. So as I mentioned, these applications run on many different Windows devices. So as you can see, this is fully responsive. So we'll adapt to the kind of screen you're on. So you can see we have a pop-up menu at the moment. So if I pull this screen out, you can see we get a smaller menu. If I pull it even further, we're going to get a more space. Get a bigger menu. So these will adapt to the type of display you're using. If we actually put our details in here, so test that. Sagcon.com. So that's the email address I used when I identified the content earlier. And this is a touch based touch screen based laptop. So you can show how this works as well. So if I look at the load uh, animals, you can see I'm actually going to take this page and you can see the animals we've seen. So if we do a little bit of a summary. So at the start, we had Bluetooth beacons transmitting a unique URL for each of those animals. When we walked around a zoo, we saw these animals. We clicked that link. We came to the page, read a bit about that animal. That was in the background being recorded into XDB. We've then created a psychoservices client API that exposes stuff from XDB. And then in this application, we're actually pulling content from Sitecore and we're pulling the XDB information in and displaying in the UI. So if you click on one of these animals, so click on the tiger. Again, click on the mouse if you need to, but I'm just using the touchscreen laptop. So as we scroll this, you can see this image is coming from Sitecore, so it's content from Sitecore. We also got the description about the animal, again, coming from Psycho. And as I said, we wanted to try and get some outcomes, some goals happening here, try and push some interaction. So if you press these three dots down here, so you can see the labels. We have two buttons, sponsor an animal and buy a toy. So these are goals. This, this, these are actions we want the user to take based on the data we know about them. So if you click the sponsor button, you can see we sponsored that animal. So that's recorded a goal in, in the behind the scenes back to Sitecore. And the other one we have is the buy toy. So you can say the toy's on the way. Obviously we could take the payment details in here as well in the production site. So that's actually called a goal service. So if I show you that briefly, what we have up in analytics, we have a goal controller, which then goes into our goal repository. We have a method here which is basically creating a goal. We're creating a fake page here because the goals are tied to the page. So I've created a fake page because obviously this is a kiosk and then we're just going to create a new interaction and register that goal. So that allows us to register goals from this kiosk. And then that's called from our goal service, which I can show you, which is just a little service I've created within uh, in here. Again, we're taking in our cookie. We're basically going to Going to create a new thread because obviously you don't want to lock the UI up when it's registering goals because the user doesn't care that it's doing that. And then we're going to do a post and then we're going to have some JSON. So this is the representation we need to send. The ID of the goal, the goal's name, the contacts, contacts identifier. So we need to know which person raised that goal. And then the goal text. So this will tell you which animal they've sponsored or um, bought the toy for. And that will just register to XDB. Oops. Thank you for listening. My contact details are up here. So if you have any questions or you want help with this, feel free to contact me. And the source is also available. Thank you.